good evening. Everybody good this evening? Listen, uh, worship was about as hot as it is outside. I started sweating during worship tonight, and I thought, wait, I'm inside an air conditioner, and I know Landon has the air conditioning flying tonight. So, well, welcome to Word of God Ministries. Hey, Mr. Touch, how you doing? Good to see you again. We work together all day, so. Anyway, hey, will you stand with me? And as you're standing, will you turn to Ephesians chapter 6? Ephesians chapter 6, I, I had an opportunity to um, chat with Pastor today. He wanted to send his love and, and just say uh, how much he misses y'all. They got away after the intense several days of Olive Tov. And uh, who is that Olive Tov? I have watched some of it uh, in, in repeat. And the reason being is because my wife and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary on June 20th. And so, yeah, give her a round of applause for putting up with me for 25 years. And so we were in the middle of the ocean on June 20th. And I have to admit, I was getting a massage and sitting in the sun. But I have gone back and watched some of it. And then I know uh, my friend uh, Ben Shetler was here for three powerful services on Sunday, and I watched uh, that as we drove back from New Orleans. And so I just wanna say, uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Tim Euler. I'm the head of school here at the Academy, and on behalf of the Academy staff and administration, I just wanna, just as I do every time I get up here, say thank you to Pastor James and Mrs. Chrissy for their support of the Academy. And then I also wanna thank each of you for your support. As, as members and givers to the, to the ministry. We could not do what we do seven days a week on this campus if it was not for your faithfulness. So thank you very much in allowing us to reach the next generation for Jesus. Yeah, go ahead. Pastor will be back on Sunday. Lord, I, the Lord willing, because that's what he always says. But he will be back on Sunday, so make sure you are here and invite a friend. Ephesians chapter six, I wanna read two verses, we'll pray and we'll dive in. I'm gonna be a little bit of a teacher tonight, is that okay? I've been in education now for 20 mm, years. And uh, well, you know I've been married for 25, so it doesn't matter to tell you, I've been in education for 26 or 27, I can't count that high. But I'm gonna be a little bit of an educator this evening, so bear with me, I do have some slides to show you, all right? And I'm gonna re there will be a test at the end, okay? So, Bozier, you already have the, uh, uh, the answers underneath your seat. So just look underneath your seat, Bozier. I already gave you the answers, and all of them over in Bozier just went like this. Anyway, if he, let's dive in. <laughs> quit playing around. I'll quit playing around, Mr. Touch, I promise. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says this, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. In the power of his might. Put on the full armor, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against each other. It's not against those that aren't here, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We ask that you go before us this evening. We ask that we walk out of here refreshed with new inspiration to serve you in such a way like we've never served you before. We ask tonight, Lord, that you, you are the guy, you are the hand, that you are the one that we listen to, that you guide each of my thoughts, every one of my words. And Lord, our prayer this evening is to bring you all the glory, honor, and praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. So if I were to title this message tonight, it's behind me, Get Off the Bench. I coached for a lot of years. Now, there's somebody in, in the room right now that coached against me. And, and I wasn't planning on doing this because I didn't know you were gonna be sitting there. But about six months ago, about six months ago, maybe a little bit longer than ago, she walks up to me and she goes, I know you. And I was like, okay. She said, I coached against you. Well, here's what you have to understand. When somebody looks at me and says, I coached against you, I, I cringe a little. 
I wasn't the kindest or the nicest person in the world. I may, some people may say today I still am not, but it is what it is. But in coaching, it was for me all about winning. If I was going to play the game, I was going to win. And every, I can remember, and I promise you, you ask my wife down here, I can recite for you the years we won the state championships, the matches and the games we lost and why. I can remember every one of those games. But you know what I can't remember? I can't remember when the ball hit the floor for championship point and we walked away with the state championship. I, I can't visualize that. But I can visualize the losses for some reason. I don't understand that, but it is what it is. But I coached for a lot of years, and so I love sports. I'm a baseball fanatic. Alex had an A's hat on. And Alex, I don't know if you know this, but the Yankees are playing them right now. And so that was a little concerning to me, but it is what it is. But I love sports, and so if I were to title this message, it'd be Get Off the Bench. I think there's many of us that are sitting on the bench right now. And we weren't created to sit, we were created to go. We were created to work. If you think of the first command given to man, it was to work the land. Be fruitful and, prosper and multiply it. It was work. But I want to talk a little bit differently about work tonight, and I want to give you three or maybe four points about getting off the bench. Pastor James made this statement in his series, Cultivating Culture, on October 20th, 2021. We are allowing the enemy to overtake our ground when we should be overtaking his. Let me say that again. October 20th, 2021, in the series Cultivating Culture, Pastor James said, we are allowing the enemy to overtake our ground when we should be overtaking his. The problem that's become in our society today across generations, it's not the old generation or the new generation or the middle generation or the X's or the Y's or the Z's or the Q's or whatever new generation they decide to name it. The problem's become is we become passive. Sometimes passive aggressive, and we'll talk about that, but we've become passive. We're not called to sit, but we're called to engage. So sitting in front of me tonight, I believe, are three different types of people. Those three different types of people are those that are in the battle. You're in the game. You're fighting. You're going to work every minute of every day to advance the kingdom. Thank you. Tonight, I hope you walk away with three ideas that will help you enhance that. There's another group of people, there's those that are new to the battle. You may, maybe attended Olive Tav and never came to church for, the, for, for, for ever in your life, but came last week for the first time, and you're saying, you know what, I need to get in this, I need this, this is what has changed me, this is what is going to help me become the person I know God created me to be. There's those that are new to the battle, and my hope tonight is you walk away with three ideas and thoughts that allow you a new appreciation for the battle in front of you. But then there's a third group. There's some that have paused being in the battle. I don't have the time. It's too hard. I don't have the money. It's like the guy that says, hey, we're, or, the, or the couple that says, we're gonna be missionaries, but they don't know their neighbor five doors down. I didn't say next door. I said five doors down. So there's some that have paused the battle, and my hope tonight is that you get encouraged to get back in the battle. Can I show you two different snapshots of society today? And I think these will come up right behind me. But I want to show you two snapshots of society today. The first snapshot I want to show you is Christianity in the USA. Christianity in the USA, there's 380,000 churches. 1,500 of those are what might be considered mega churches, 2,000 plus in weekly attendance. There's 4,000 church plants every year, and 62% of the population says they identify as Christians. Christianity in the USA, there's 15,000 Christian elementary and secondary schools. There's five plus million students in homeschool education. There's 225 Bible colleges. There's 900 plus Christian colleges and universities. There's 200 plus seminaries. 
Christianity in the U.S. There's 1,600 Christian radio stations. Last month, and I know this because I just looked it up, there were 215 million listeners last month alone to Christian radio. $15.9 billion was the music sales in 2022 for Christian music. Christian book sales in 2022, 757 million. Since 2000, there's been 200 plus faith-based films, the top 13 grossing $1.7 billion. Those are pretty good numbers. That's pretty good. We should be giving ourselves a pat on the back and a round of applause. But each of us know very well we can walk out of here and see a society that is completely broken, fallen apart, and destroyed. So let's look at a second snapshot of the USA. The culture today. Approximately 65 million aborted babies since 1973. Bills passed to abort babies right up until birth or even after. The Senate defeated a bill that would require medical care to be given to a baby who survived an abortion. Planned Parenthood counselor told the client, if the baby is born at home, simply flush it. Now, thankfully, in our country, they've given that authority back to the states, and 20 plus states have reversed abortion in our nation. So thankfully, the first stats are having an impact. Culture in the U.S., mass shooting reaching an epic proportions. School shootings have increased regularly since Columbine tragedy. Being in education, I know this all too well. Violent protests in cities in 2020 condoned by government officials. 1.7 million plus people in confinement in the, United, in the American criminal justice system. One out of four adults have a criminal record. I don't want to condone you if you have a criminal record, but these are just the stats. Somewhere down the path, we've wavered. Culture in the USA, same-sex marriage legalized. Laws allow free use of restrooms and locker rooms for, for gender preference. Sex is biological. Gender become, has become a choice. Transgender females dominating women's sports. 70-plus gender options in Facebook alone since 2014. Gender-altering drugs given to minors without parent modification here in, or notification. Here in Louisiana, there's a big fight over just that right now. Is the governor going to veto it? Is, is the Senate and the, and the House then going to reverse the veto? Where, where's this going to end up? 38% of Gen Z identify as LBGTQ+. So if you take the first portion of our stats... And you compare it to the second portion of our stats, what's happened? I think there's many of us that come to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. Maybe we go on a missions trip once a year. Maybe we give, maybe we don't, I don't know. But I think there's many of us that have for too long sat on the sidelines. We've cheered on the pastors and other leaders in the fight and watched as the enemy has advanced his agenda. Make no mistake, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against the powers of the wicked one. So I want to give you an example of a young man that got into the battle. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 17. And I want you to look at this from a little bit different perspective. If I were to say to you the, word, the name David from the Bible, the first most known story with David in a positive manner is Goliath. And I want to look at this, but I want to look at it from just a little bit different angle tonight. And I want to dive in and study it. Let's, look, let's start in verse 1. Or let's start actually just in, let's just go to verse 3. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain of the other side. And there was a valley between them. Do you realize that there will always be a valley that separates you from your victory? There will always be a valley that separates you from your victory. Think of real life situations. You're on a mountaintop, or, and then you look over to that mountaintop, and you go, I want to get to there. And then you start progressing to there, and what happens? Struggle comes. Tragedy may come. But there's always a valley standing between you and your victory. 
So many of us just frankly at this point would just say, hey, we'll just give up because I'm not willing to go through a valley to get to my next victory. And there came out a champion in verse four, out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath, setting the, the tone here. Goliath was a height of six cubits and spanned. He was huge, he was a big dude, he was scary. Jump with me down to verse 17, if you will, and let's get into the, into the meat of this story. And Jesus, or in Jesus, and Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an Ephron of parched corn and ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren. And carry ten cheeses unto the captain of, thy, of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Basically what Jesse is saying, hey, I want you to go check on your brothers. You're not old enough to fight yet. You're not big enough to fight yet. I want you to just take this bread and cheese, be the errand boy. Even though we know at this point David was already anointed, be the errand boy, go, take the bread and cheese and check on your brothers and make sure they're okay because I know that battle is not going to be a good one. So David, David got ready to go. And we look in verse 20 and it says this, and this is my first point that I wanna make with you this evening. To get off the bench and get in the battle, you have to get prepared. Practice always works. Verse 20, and David rose up in the morning and, the, and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went and just as Jesse had commanded him and came to the trench as the host was going forth in the fight and shouted, shouted to the battle. Now let's look at this verse a little closer. First thing that we know David did is he got up early in the morning. How many of you get up before the sun rises? Raise your hand. I had a couple of you that began to raise your hand. You go, no close. All right, put your hands down. <clears throat> so we're on the cruise, right? I wake up at this time, this time. My wife wakes up at this time. Notice the difference. Work starts here, okay? I don't think you got it. I wake up here. She wakes up here. Work starts here, okay? So I wake up really early. And as I'm studying for this over the last week, I, I looked at this and I thought, boom, got her. This is exactly why you should wake up at 4 a.m. This is exactly why you should get in the word early. This is exactly why if you're not up before when the, when, the, when the chicken, when the rooster crows, that you're wasting the day. So then I thought, you know what? I'm gonna do what pastor does. I'm gonna begin to research this word early. And so I found out very quickly that that's not the truth. Have you, have you heard these verses before? Psalms 127.2 says this, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for, those, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Proverbs 27.14 says, he that blesses his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning, it shall be counted a curse to him. I'm glad my boys haven't found that verse yet. Because when I yell up the, up the stairs and I say, boys, let's go, I don't want them to look back at me and say, Proverbs 24, 27, 14 says, rising early in the morning, this should be counted a curse to him. Let me tell you exactly what this idea of David rose up early in the morning meant. What it meant was to get ready. Don't waste time. It literally means to load up on the back of a man. The Lord desires to dwell with us early in the morning, but he can also dwell with us in the evening. The focus is not at the time, it's in the doing. The, if you wanna get prepared for the battle, you have to spend time with the captain. If you refuse to spend time with the captain, the commander in chief, then what ends up happening is you're not prepared for the battle. So whether that time is in the morning, for me, or in the evening for somebody else, it's not about the time. It's about the doing of it. And so the first thing we learn from David is that he, he loaded himself up with knowledge of God. 
He was in the word. Just look at how much of the, of the Old Testament David wrote. Look at Psalms. He was loaded up with the word. That's literally what that, what that translation means there. And David rose up early in the morning. It means he loaded himself up. He literally got himself prepared for battle. The focus is not on the time of the day, but dwelling with him and acting on the relationship. See, when David called on the name of Jesus, when David called on the name of God, God answered him. Why? Because he recognized his son's voice. So I told you we were on the cruise, right? I'm studying. So the first day I, I'm studying and I put this together and I'm sitting there with my wife next to the pool. I said, baby, I think it'll probably come out. I think I, think I found scripture that points to the fact you need to get up early and have quiet time in the morning. She was like, oh, really? And the next morning, now you gotta, you gotta picture this. I'm down by the pool by 7 a.m., all right? She arrives. My dad and, and his wife came with us. They arrive later. I'm like, man, it's almost lunchtime. Let's go, people. The second day, my wife shows up by the pool, and I said, I got a problem. She said, what's wrong? I said, that verse didn't mean what I thought it meant. It actually meant something else. She said, really? I said, yeah, I hope it doesn't come up, but I think it may have to that I'm gonna have to start being a little bit quieter in the mornings. But in all jokingness aside, we realize that David really loaded up with the word. Do you realize what he did second? He left the sheep with a keeper. How many of you have ever left your children with somebody you don't know? Raise your hand. Like, somebody you, at, okay, I see two or three. Okay, I'm a mandatory reporter, we'll take care of that later, all right? But, but very few of us leave our children with somebody we don't know. So we put my son on a plane, on a jet plane, off to Florida to spend time with his cousins while we went on our little cruise, my youngest son. The older ones, I don't even, they're, I don't even we don't know. We don't know. My youngest son, we've got to still take care of him. We're almost out of that stage, almost empty nesters, we're close. Then we got the grandkids. They can come over anytime they want but anyway, hallelujah. But then, but then he, we put him on a jet. But let me tell you, I had that planned out to the T. And the reason being is because I'm not going to put my, hand, my, kid, my children in the hands of somebody else. David left his sheep. He, didn't, he, he was already prepared for this. He had already prepared because he thought one day I'm going to be called to something and i got to make sure my sheep are well taken care of. So this... in. in this, this speaks to that he had already prepared for something he didn't even know he was going to be doing. So what today is God preparing you for that you don't even know you're going to be doing? See, the preparation comes in the relationship and the time being spent together. The preparation comes in getting in this word so that when you get off the bench and you get in the game and you realize, wait, I didn't realize we were going to be doing that you're already prepared. The word does not return void. He left him with a keeper. He already had a friend. He already knew he was, what he was going to do, and he took, and he went to Jesse as he commanded him. He followed Jesse's command. He didn't create his own template to how it was going to go. He followed Jesse's command, and then he came to the trench. And you know, it's so sad because most of us are hiding out in the trench because the warfare is way too hard. I should have told you, as Pastor does all the time, put a bookmark there, but I need you to go back to Ephesians 6. Put a bookmark in 1 Samuel 17. We're coming back. But go back to Ephesians 6, because many of us jump out of the battle because we think it's just too difficult. But in, in Ephesians chapter 6, it gives us the template. It tells us exactly how to go to war. As my friend Ben Shetler says all the time, wouldn't it be awesome if there was a, somebody who wrote a book that gave us a template? Here it is. Ephesians 6, verse 13. Right after we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, the darkness of the world in verse 12, this wickedness in high places. We got major wickedness in high places in our nation today. Don't get, me, don't get me spiraled on that rabbit trail. 
Verse 13, back to the word. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor. What's the whole armor? That you may withstand the evil day. Okay. And having done all to stand. Stand therefore. Ready? Here's the template to go to battle with. One, have your loins girt with truth. Go to battle with truth. Go to battle with this word. Do not waver off of this. See, we get in the game and we think we got to recreate the, the, the agenda and the template. No, this is the template. Go to battle, go with, to war with this. Truth. Then, it says, and having the breastplate of righteousness, stand with your feet shot in preparation of the gospel of peace. You know what concerns me at times? Is we pick fights over things we should not pick fights over. Instead of just loving people, in loving them into the fold, we pick fights with people and things that we do not need. Do y'all like that stress? Because I don't. You know that phrase, determine what hill to die on? I don't know if I necessarily like that because I don't plan on dying. But the idea is pick your battles. Does this say preparation of the gospel of war? No. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're to walk in truth, but we're to do it in love. As followers of Jesus Christ, we're to walk and sit at the table with the kings and the queens and the mayors and the, and the presidents. And we're not to pick fights, but we're to speak truth. I know it's easy to fight with family. But there's times, all the time, let it go. Let God do the convicting. Let God focus on fixing their heart because guess what? You probably, me, speaking to me, this isn't even in my notes, I don't know where this is coming from, I must need it, probably have an issue that needs to be dealt with before they got an issue that needs to be dealt with. We're to walk in peace, y'all. We're not, that was pretty good in Louisiana. We're not to walk in war. We're not to walk in with a heavy stick. We're to walk with truth, but carry it out in peace and love. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Do you realize that faith is what quenches the fiery darts that are trying to kill you daily? Let me say that again. Faith is what quenches the fiery darts that try to kill you daily. It says it right there. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Do you realize that the only time in all of those it says go on the offense with a sword, it's with this book right here and not your own thoughts. Speak truth and love through the word. So we have to be prepared. And how then finally do we get prepared? By praying Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. If you're thinking about getting into the battle, you need to do it in such a way that allows you to be prepared in the word and in prayer. Let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and let's look at the second portion of this. So many people don't get in the battle because they're afraid. Do you know that 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Exodus 15.2-3 says, The Lord is my strength and my song. This is out of the Amplified Classic Edition. And he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. It doesn't say you and I are a man or a woman of war. It says the Lord is. The Lord fights our battles. We fight our battle through prayer and worship. 
The Lord then convicts. Second Kings, um, let's see, uh, yeah, Second Kings 6.16 says, and he answered, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that are against us. Romans 16, 20, and the God of peace shall bruise Satan's feet. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Nowhere in scripture does it say fight the battle yourself. It always says take with you the truth, the shield of the breastplate of salvation, and the list goes on. Look what David did. Look what David did, and let's look at verse 21. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. They were ready to go. And David left his carriage. Have you ever realized, I, I, we've, we've, we've read this two or three times now, David has to leave something to get to the battle? David has to leave the comfort of shepherding to get to the battle. David has to leave the comfort of the bunker to get to the battle. David has to leave the comfort of his, of his carriage that carried him there to get to the battle. When you step out of your comfort into the battle, it's going to be scary, but you are not overcome by the spirit of fear. So your daily life will always not be fair and, and, and you know, rainbows and fun. It'll be a challenge. We're not called to not get in the battle. We're called to be in the battle. So it'll be a challenge, but what, what won't happen is you won't go to the battle without being prepared if you're in the word and in prayer, and therefore your victory will come. If you continue in this, it says ran into the army. David's always running somewhere. David's always on the go. He's never wasting time. He's getting after it and came and saluted his brethren. This whole idea is that David had no fear. Why? Because he walked in the spirit of God. He had walked with God out there in the fields. He had been prepared. Just, just in, in my Bible, you've got to kind of just look over a little bit, but jump over to verse 34 and look how prepared David was. David wasn't afraid of some Goliath. Why? And David said unto Saul, verse 34, thy servant kept his father's sheep and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock and I went after him. Who's gone after a lion or a bear in here? I ain't. I'm like, okay, that one down. I'll try to keep, uh, uh, keep these other 90, okay. You, got, you win. No. David's always run into something. Why? Because he's, he's spent so much time in the word. He's spent so much time in, pre in pre preparation. He's ready to get there, and he has no fear. Why? Because he doesn't be governed by fear. So many times we stop having a, a, a conversation in truth with individuals because we're afraid of being rejected. We don't invite people to church. Why? Because all they'll do is say no. Will they? I don't know. David said, and I went out, verse 35, I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Just picture that for a second. Just picture David grabbing that bear and that lion by the beard and slaying them. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, it says in verse 36. And this uncirc uncircumcised Philistine shall be, just be one of them. David wasn't arrogant. David wasn't pious. He was confident in his God. He was confident that his God is the God of Isaac and Jacob. His God is the one that will overcome any fear that he has. He was confident that his God was going to help his people conquer the territory. David wasn't arrogant. David wasn't cocky. David had no you know, pious about him. He was confident, not in his own, but in his God. Seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. How did David know Goliath was going down? Because, gate, because Goliath trashed God. We're going to look at a verse at the end that says, you know what? We don't have to fight the battles God is already fighting. All we have to be is a vessel for him. We have to be a light on a hill that will not be hid. We have to be a beacon for him. 
in, in, in a person of truth for him, but we don't have to fight the battles. We cannot convict somebody. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. David said, moreover, in verse 37, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. Now here's what's interesting. Here's where fear and preparation come together. Ready? Fear and preparation come together in these verses. Here it is. And Saul armed David with his armor. And he put on, put a helmet of brass upon his head and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and he was assayed to go. For he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these for I have not proved them. And the idea that David is in full armor ready to go to battle. Full armor, ready to go to battle. And here's what ends up happening. He just starts taking it all off. There's some things that other people have put on you that have tried to prepare you for the battle they think you need to be prepared for that you need to remove. You need to go to battle with what the Lord has given you, not with what he's given Landon. You need to go to battle with what he's given you and not what he's given Diana. You need to go to battle with what he's given you and not what he's given Charlotte. You need to go to battle and not with what he's given you and not what he's given to me. He uniquely designed you for a time such as this. So there's some things you gotta take off. There's some armor. You go, I don't need to run to a battle with a sword. No, not if you're really good with a sling. I'll give you an example. If I came up here right now and we had a sing-off between me and Ryan, I'd win. I'd win. You know why? Because I'm better. No, I'm not. I can't sing against that guy. Like, it's none of my business, but he can move back home to Shreveport any day he wants. And he can stay right here. Nothing against anybody else, but I didn't know he was going to be here. And I came sprinting in when I heard Ryan was here. I'm like, I gotta go, I need to go. But there's some things that people arm you with that's not prepared for you. You haven't tried those things on. There is zero way David could go to war with Saul's weapons. But we know David defeats Goliath, takes his staff, he takes his sling. And he takes five stones. And we won't get into those five stones tonight because we don't have time for that. But he takes what he's ready to go with. He takes what he's comfortable with. He takes what he was prepared with. He's not fearful because he's going to battle. He's going to battle for the Lord. And he also knows that there's a reason for this. And it's in verse 27. David says this in verse 27. Is there not a cause? Now you follow that down and David says, let me tell you why Goliath will fall. He will fall because he, he provoked my God. He didn't provoke me. He didn't poke me. He didn't provoke you. He provoked God. God is the judge. We are not the judge. We are the instrument of truth. We are the instrument of peace. We are the instrument of love. You allow God to take care of what God takes care of and you go with your battle ready items and you serve him see this is where preparation and fear come together because you can be prepared all day and then all of a sudden David could have gone you know what you're right I need to wear a size 15 shoe because that will intimidate Goliath and David's wearing a size 7 yeah yeah that's going to work it, it, it's easier said than done I know I get it but let me tell you why let me tell you how you get girded up in your own battle gear. You get up early. You get it on you. You try it out. You all of a sudden go, man, the Lord helped me with that little victory right there. I got that little victory done. God is so good. Look what God did here. Can you believe what God did here? In your minds right now, you're picturing victories that God has gotten you through. 
You didn't get through those victories with warfare I go to war with. You got through those victories with warfare you go to war with. I can't go to war with the same battle armor as Mr. Touch. I can't do it, and vice versa. You go to war with what God equipped you with, and don't think second about it. Don't worry about it. You will be put in high places. You will be raised up because you were created in him, in his image. You were created in his likeness. David was just as good as the, as, as the best Warrior in the land, why? Because he had spent time with his God and he knew he was going to battle for a reason. So the first thing is, you gotta, you gotta be prepared. The second thing is, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta get rid of that fear. You're not gonna lose. Well, how do I know you're not? Because the battle isn't yours. The Lord says that over and over again in scripture. The battle is mine. Just do what I ask you to do. You know what's interesting about David is he was forgotten. But he was equipped. David was alone but he was called. David was rejected, but he was well prepared. David had no earthly teacher, but David was tested and proved to be faithful. In this passage, we didn't look at it, but David was made fun of by his brothers, but David was secure in who God created him to be. David was anointed, yet not positioned, but David became the ultimate victor. And why did he become the victor? Look in verse 29. I think I said it was 27 earlier. I apologize. In verse 29, David said, what have I done after he's gotten, been made fun of and told that he was there with a prideful heart and the naughtiness of thine heart and that he just came to see the battle and try to be cool and be able to go back and tell stories. That's verse 27 and 28. David said, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Now fast forward with me. Fast forward with me all the way to verse 45. Then David, then said David to the Philistine, he standed before the Philistine. He's standing before the Philistine. And they're getting ready to have a fight. And the Philistines making fun of him too. Then David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This day will the Lord deliver me, deliver thee into mine hand. I will smite thee. I will take thy head from thee. I will give thee the carcass of the host of the Philistines is day under the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. David was not there to defend himself. David was not there to defend the kingdom. David was not there to defend his brothers. David was not there to make a name for himself, to create a story that we talk about 4,000, 6,000 years later. David was not there to, to do anything other than one thing. Is there not a cause? David was there to bring glory to God in everything he said and did. That's the battle. The battle is, are you willing to get into it for one reason and one reason only, not to make a name for yourself, but to bring glory to Jesus? How do you do that? You gird yourself up. You don't worry about what the enemy has to say. Turn with me to Revelations 12. See, I've read the end of the book. I can walk in peace, not in arrogance, not in pride, not on Facebook bashing people. I don't have to pick those fights. I don't have to act like I'm self-righteous. Why? I just have to walk in peace, walk in love. Why? Because I've read the end of the book. Revelations 12, verse 10, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. 
For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Just as Goliath fell, just as whatever your, the giant is in your life will fall, just as David defeated Goliath, one day Jesus will defeat the enemy, which accused them before God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe is to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. I have read the end of the book. I know who is the victor. I don't have to walk in fear. I know I can be prepared to walk in truth. I know I can walk out in peace. I don't have to pick fights. I don't have to decide to downgrade or, or, or injure people with my words. I just walk in in the truth girded in this word. And I say, I'm going to stand on that. I'm going to live on that. I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to allow that to guide me because I've read the end of the book. And one day, enemy, you know your time is short. And I know your time is short. And one day, the trumpet's going to sound. I'm not going to die. The trumpet's going to sound. I Listen, I don't have time to sleep right now. There's a battle to fight right now. I don't have time to sit back and wait for somebody to tell me what to do. I've got to get in. I've got to start serving more. I've got to start giving more. I've got to start living more for, to serve people than myself. I don't have time to waste. Why? Because eternity is at stake. Remember this, David wasn't given anything by man that God hadn't already granted him. Promotion comes from above, your promotion has already been ordained. We started, and I looked at this verse right at the beginning as we begin to wrap up, 1 Samuel 17, verse three, it said this, the Philistines stood on one side and Israel stood on the other side and there was a valley between them. And I said, there's always a valley that separates you and your victory. And I want to encourage you tonight. I want to encourage you tonight. There's a victory waiting for you. It's not going to be easy. This word right here is going to allow you to get there. And what did David write out of this? What did David learn out of this? Here's what he learned. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. Can you imagine being David just lying down in green pastures, not having a fear that a snake's gonna crawl over you? That's faith. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Picture this. David is walking down that mountain. And on the other side stands this giant. And his shadow is down in the valley. And it's overtaken David. And David is saying, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of Goliath. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, thy Holy Spirit and thy word, they comfort me. That's how we fight our battle. That's why we get off the bench. That's what causes us to go into tomorrow. Let me tell you right now. If it wasn't for Wednesday night, I couldn't get to Thursday. Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays are tough days. Third, Wednesday night comes and I'm going, I can make it through Thursday and Friday now. Saturday, I don't know. I got to figure something out for Saturday yet. Y'all, we don't have time to sit on the sidelines any longer. We already know we've won. Now we gotta go out and play like it. So I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up in courage knowing that whatever is on the other side of that valley is a victory for you. Now you gotta go with the right heart. You gotta go with the right motive. You gotta go with the right intensity. Don't take extra intensity into something that just requires something simple. The Lord's your shepherd. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemy. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. You know, you can't 
you can't stand up here and say stuff until it's affected you. And 2023 has been a journey for me already. It's been a journey. A journey with not much sleep. But you know what? Man, I am doing great because my Redeemer lives. When the calendar turned to 2023, nobody would have a clue what today might hold for you. You know, January 1, 12.01 a.m., you didn't know what, to, you didn't know what was going to be going on in your life today. You thought you had a plan. You thought you had a direction. And then it happened. Whatever it is, it happened. And took you down another path. And then that took you down another path. And then you had to get straightened out a little bit and get back on the right path. But you know what? Only God can do that. Only God can provide today, provide for us on January 1st what we needed for today. So my prayer for you as we wrap up is that you get in the game. I don't want you to get in the game to advance your personal agenda. Don't do that. Don't get in the game to advance a certain cause. Nah. Go serve at the hub. Go become a greeter. Go serve in the children's ministry. Go get involved with the homeless downtown. Go do something that doesn't sit under the spotlight. And watch God bless you because you got in the battle. Lord Jesus, our prayer tonight is that you help us run to the battle that you want us to be in. But then help us run in such a way that we don't grow weary, we don't faint, because it was your doing. Help us get off the bench. Help us get engaged in the lives of our neighbors. You know, maybe what we need to do is maybe we need to just pause for a second and say, okay, let's get creative, all right? In two weekends, it's gonna be really hot outside. What can I do to serve my neighbors? I'm not asking you to do it tomorrow. You gotta do a little bit of planning. You gotta prepare See, that's run into the battle. See, oftentimes we think of the battle as a fight. No, I've tried, to, I've tried to drill that down. It's not about a fight. It's about going and serving. Get engaged in the game. Because that neighbor four or five doors down that you take water to or an ice cream to or a cake to or whatever you make that's really good is all of a sudden going to know your name. And in about two weeks... You're going to be able to look at them and go, hey, want to come to church with me? And they're going to go, sure. Yeah, something changed you because I haven't seen you in 10 years. Come on, y'all. Eternity is at stake. We got to go. We got to work hard. Do we got to rest? Yeah, we do. Keep your Sabbath. My wife and my assistant tell me all the time, what's your Sabbath? I'm like, don't worry about me. Keep going. Keep your Sabbath. We got to go. Eternity is at stake. Why? Because we need the whole world to know that there's a God in Israel. Jesus, as we close tonight, thank you. Thank you for a reminder that getting in the game is fun. Getting in the game is victorious. And getting off the bench and engaging in people's lives to advance your name and not our own is exactly what you've called us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Listen, our pastor is gonna be back here on Sunday, Lord willing. If this place isn't filled, so you know how you get in the game? Invite somebody. I have a buddy, he brings a whole row. Who can bring the whole row? Right? 
Love y'all. We'll see you Sunday at 8, 9.45 or 11.30. If you need prayer, there's prayer warriors down here that will pray with you. Love you. Thank you again. Have a blessed evening. And stay in the air condition for a couple minutes in fellowship.